Thanks everyone for being here for our distinguished lecture series. We're so honored tonight to have Ms. D. Wrigley Miller as our, as our honored guest, as well as Fred Sarver, who will be uh, participating in the interview. And you'll get some more introduction later on, Ms. D., but just let me tell you, I'm thrilled. I'm one of your fans, and I'm thrilled that you're here tonight. I've watched you show a lot, and um, it's going to be exciting. So. We appreciate that. And um, you were nominated by many of our students as a great candidate for our Distinguished Lecture Series. So that means a lot to all of us when that happens. So so um, very good, and we're, we're excited. Um, um, I mentioned Fred Sarver. Fred is the um, one of our members of our advisory committee for equine programs. We also have tonight uh, Jamie Link is here, Stuart Brown and um, a past member of our advisory committee, Walter Zent. Uh, there are also a whole lot of people from Haggard's here, and, and that is really great to see all of you all. Uh, we so appreciate the sponsorship by Haggard's of this lecture series. It means a lot to us that you have confidence in our programs and show support for, for this series. Uh, we have had a lot of luminaries before, um, in addition to MISD this evening. And so we thank Haggard's especially. Um, we also are really proud of all of our students and our faculty and leaders in our equine programs. We call it UK Ag Equine Programs. It's been the fastest growing undergraduate program in the history of the College of Agriculture and maybe probably UK as well, um, with over 300 students now after starting officially in 2009. We believe our students, um, a lot of the reason they come here is because we're the horse capital of the world. And with that, um, the, our students get to learn from a lot of industry professionals. They do internships in the industry. And we are very proud to have our students. And we thank all of you for being here and um, being part of this program tonight. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Jill Stowe, and I'm the director of the UK Ag Equine Programs. And I would also like to welcome you and thank you for coming to tonight's event. Um, the purpose of the Distinguished Lecture Series is very simply uh, to give our students the opportunity to learn from the best that our industry has to offer. And we're very excited that you're here tonight. Um, in past years, we have had guests from the thoroughbred, jumping, eventing, and reining segments of the industry. And we're very excited to explore two new parts of the industry, very distinct worlds, uh, the saddlebred industry and combined driving. Um, I would venture to guess that MISD is the first individual to win the three great gated Grand Slam and compete at the World Equestrian Games in combined driving. Um, but in addition to her success in the equestrian world, she uh, leads and is involved in a number of other really interesting uh, efforts, including running Hillcroft Farm in Paris, Kentucky, which um, of course has horses, but is really a highly diversified agricultural operation with a focus on stewardship. Um, she serves as co-owner of Post Time Productions, a video production studio in Lexington, Kentucky, and that goes back to her interest in broadcast journalism, which she got her undergrad degree in, um, and also has recently led the way in an effort to rebuild the history um, of the saddlebreds at Spindletop Farm. Before we learn more, I would like to invite Paige Shanky, a junior equine science and management major from Wisconsin, to share some of her thoughts on what it means to have Ms. D. Wrigley Miller here tonight. As I sat down in the barn to write this short speech, listening to the working feet of American saddlebreds trot past me, I began to reflect upon why I'm in this place we call the horse capital of the world. A girl from small town Wisconsin, I grew up like many of you in the audience, horse crazy and determined to get my hands on one. Like my fellow students studying equine management at the University of Kentucky, I've decided to chase those four-legged dreams through education. Being a student at the University of Kentucky means more than going to classes or skipping a few here and there to go to Keeneland and going to basketball games. Here, you will find faculty members who build personal relationships with each and every student and encourage us to run down our ever-evolving equine dreams. For some, this means aspiring to be trainers, lesson instructors, and grooms. For others, this means advertising, management, and sales. From the athletic and streamlined thoroughbred to the charismatic and spirited American saddlebred, we all have fallen madly in love with the same thing, horses. This is something we all have in common with our speaker for this evening, Ms. D. Wrigley Miller. I am honored to be in the presence of this world-class equestrian and generous philanthropist. 
From a young age, I can remember watching Ms. D at the World Championship Horse Show, carrying roses around Freedom Hall time after time. I specifically remember World Grand Champion Grande Gill carrying Mizzy to the Yellow Roses and his never-ending willingness to do his best for his rider. The bond between Mizzy and her beloved three-gated mount was almost palpable. Looking back on those memories, it is no surprise that I find myself here today, more immersed in the saddlebird industry than I ever have been. It is women and men like Mizzy that inspire young, horse-crazy children to chase their dreams and to see them through an equine equal. Now, it is individuals like Mizzy who inspire me as a young woman to make professional goals in the horse industry and not just sit on the sidelines. Upon this horse-filled reflection, I had a feeling of gratitude come over me, and I realized how truly thankful I am for the passion that we all share. I am thankful for the inspiration from those whom I looked up to as a child and those who I continue to look up to today. I am thankful for the opportunities that studying equine management at the University of Kentucky has given me. And most of all, I am thankful for those sometimes temperamental, flighty, snorty, elegant, and animated horses I fell in love with as a child. As students, faculty members, equine enthusiasts, and today as audience members, I hope you can remember what brought you here today and always remember the horses that inspired you to chase your four-legged dreams. Thank you so much for being here, Ms. Z. On the behalf of my fellow students, I welcome you. And thank you all so much for having me this evening. Uh, tonight's event would not be possible without the support of Haggard Equine Medical Institute. We are thankful for their support, which has allowed students to have this opportunity every year. Um, and I would like to invite Stuck, Dr. Stuart Brown um, to share some thoughts with, uh, thoughts with us and also thank those uh, other members at Haggard's who are here tonight. Thank you, Dr. Stowe. I, you know, I think uh, probably no better example than what Paige expressed for one of the reasons that we've been so proud to be a part of this distinguished lecture series at Haggard's. Um, you know, this wonderful major that has been invested upon within the College of Agriculture truly is a great jewel of, of the college here in the equine sciences program as the fastest growing major in the university. Our practice is at a rich heritage on the eve of almost our 140th anniversary uh, here in Lexington as being a big part of the community here. And we have a rich heritage involved with uh, programs here at the University of Kentucky through the College of Agriculture and the Veterinary Sciences program here. The Distinguished Lecture Series, though, is a wonderful opportunity as an interface for the resources within our equine community to come and share their experiences with students that are a part of the college. And we've been blessed by having such a diverse and wonderful group of, uh, of lecturers over the years that have come and shared their experiences, the opportunities that they identified as they encroached upon their careers in the world of, of horse, uh, the horse industry, as well as in a lot of the other disciplines that they've shared in their experience in life. So we truly have been very, very blessed to be a part of the series and we look forward to, to this year's uh, lecture with Misty and, and her sharing those opportunities and insights that made her the wonderful horsewoman that she is. Um, also, uh, I am thankful tonight to have the honor of uh, and the privilege of introducing Fred Sarver to you as the moderator. If you've not been to this program before, this is a wonderful format, much like a fireside chat type format, where the students have actually had the opportunity to interact as well through the moderator with, qu with questions that they have for our honoree tonight, as well as to develop just this wonderful dialogue and this great conversation that we'll be a part of here as the audience tonight. Fred is probably well known to a lot of you, serves on the Dean's Advisory Council as a part of the Equine Sciences Program here at the college, having over 40 years of experience in the American saddlebred industry, so uh, could think of no better uh, person to moderate tonight's uh, event. So with that, I turn it over to Fred. Well, thank you, Stuart. Uh, of course, what Dr. Stowe told me when, when, when I came in said, I know Misty shouldn't be nervous, but you should. <laughs> You know, it's, it's with great pleasure that uh, uh, I was invited to be a moderator tonight with my good friend, Misty Miller. Uh, we go back a long, long ways. We're also neighbors. We don't live very far apart, too. And in and, and beginning with this, I would have to say that if you want to talk about excellence in horsemanship, she's sitting here right now. And, and uh, because... Uh, I want to really try to bring in as many of the questions that the students have brought to us. Uh, the first one on my list is where I would like to start, Misty, and it, it, it simply says, what is the most enjoyable part of your career? <laughs> so you start, you're starting off with a, a really tough one. Um, 
the most enjoyable part of my career is that moment every morning when I walk into the barn and I see my horses and it, no matter how many times I've gone into training or, or do what I do, it's, it's a new day every day. I'm gonna have a new challenge every day with my equine partners and that challenge with my horses and that experience with my horses is the most enjoyable part of what I do. Well put. Uh, from your bio, we all read and we know, and of course, we know that you started with your family's Arabian horses. Mm -hmm. And I thought it might be nice if you could give us just a little bit of a history lesson from that point and how things develop with you to reach your pinnacle of success that you enjoy today. Be careful what you ask for. <laughs> <laughs> we have an hour and a half. Oh, that's good. <laughs> it, it will take just about that. Um, I am so blessed. I, um, I'm a fourth generation horsewoman, and horses have always been an integral part of, of our family. And um, I remember sitting at my grandmother's desk, which is my desk today, by the way, and she would talk about the importance of pedigrees and breeding mares to stallions that would hopefully result in what she called a beautiful athlete. Um, Philip and Helen Wrigley were a little different horse breeders because they chose to breed horses on Catalina Island, which is a, a very remote desert island. And my grandfather believed that the Arabian horses were hardy animals and they would thrive. He, he also ran Santa, and Santa Catalina Island Company and uh, there were tours. And he said, people aren't going to tour unless there's something to see. So he wanted horses on the, the hills on Catalina Island. And he tried Palominos, but they weren't hardy enough. So he said, I'm going to bring Arabians. And that began a, a really the beginning of Arabian horse breeding in America, which I'm, I'm very proud to, to have been a, a part of that. Um, so as I said, I sat at my grandmother's desk, and she taught me about pedigrees and the importance of pedigrees and blood and breeding different types of blood to, to hopefully have a hand with God in creating something better. And she was so passionate about that. And my grandfather was just passionate about having a good working horse. So that's, that's how I, I grew up. And um, his Arabian horses weren't in hand horses. His Arabian horses were cutting horses. They were reining horses. They, um, they, they worked the cattle on, on Santa Catalina Island. So that, that was my basis, and I grew up riding on those, those um, mountains. And um, so from a, a very early age, I was just instilled with um, uh, our responsibility as, as horse breeders, because the next generation of, of horses are literally in our hands. Um, and the importance of creating something better, you know, to, to leave for future generations. So that's really my, that's what I grew up with. And then I was introduced to the show ring. And, uh, and you know, I went, I went from the prairie to the show ring, and I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> it was like Hollywood called. <laughs> um, so uh, I'll never forget my very first time in the show ring. Um, I, I was eight years old, and it was a, a Western Pleasure class, 13 years and under, and there were nine horses in it, and I got eighth, and I was so thrilled that I beat someone. I, I just, I was just over the moon. And then I was sort of hooked, and, and it went from there to a, a lifelong passion until I, I got to college. Well, and after you went to college, you were a journalism major as well. And, and, uh, and I think uh, somewhere along the line you had to make a decision what you were going to do, whether you were going to pursue, pursue an active career there, a full-time career, but something got in your way, I think. It, well, it, yeah, it's, it's called a beautiful Arabian stallion. Um, <laughs> no, the, uh, 
the, the story there is I, I also grew up in the horse business and the broadcast business, and um, my stepfather owned a, a television station, and um, he was a president of the CBS affiliates. So it, honestly, Walter Cronkite was Uncle Walter to me. Um, and how blessed are you? I mean, you know, to, to get to, to grow up with a man of, of that caliber and um, those journalistic values. And um, which, you know, we, we would all have, our families would have dinner together and we would talk about the importance of media in American life. And so that was always sort of in the back of my head. But Paige, you know, I had no desire to go to college whatsoever. I was going to be a horse trainer. I was going to run my parents' ranch. I, you know, I didn't need a college education. And my parents begged me. And I said, no, I've, I've got my life plan. And um, my mother conspired with a man by the name of Norman K. Dunn at Cal, Cal Poly University. And um, she said, if Misty just sends an application in, sends it in. Maybe you could bring her in and make her part of the Arabian horse program, the continuation of Kellogg Arabians. So I said, okay, mom, I'll just toss it in. I don't care. And you know, two weeks later, I get, congratulations, you've been accepted <laughs> to Cal Poly Pomona. And I'm like, hey, okay, okay. So um, I was in the need of finding you know, some other classes to take. I said, oh, I know about broadcast. So I took some broadcast um, uh, law classes, and it was sort of like what happened when I, uh, the first time I went to the show ring, I went, there's something that just clicked, and um, so I told my parents that I was changing majors, that I would like to transfer to the Walter Cronkite School of Broadcast Journalism at Arizona State, and I wanted to become a broadcast journalist. And, and my parents were great. They, that, oh, good, a, a real career. <laughs> how, how smart are you? So years passed, and I, I did, and I was on air, and, and I loved it. And um, I got a very fateful call um, from CBS in New York because Ted Turner had recently started 24-hour news. And they were looking for reporters to be on air 24 hours. And they offered me the 2 a.m. to 5 a.m. shift, <laughs> the graveyard in New York City. And I was in my early 20s. And, and I actually had a, a friend who had gone on to New York. Um, and she said, Misty, if all you want to do with the rest of your life is broadcast journalism, if that's all you want out of your life, you don't want a personal relationship, and certainly if you never want to see a horse again, take the job, and you'll, you'll fly to the moon. So I, I'm like, God, oh, never see a horse again. Forget the personal relationships, but never see a horse again. <laughs> and my mother um, actually, was, she's very crafty because I, I live very close to her. Okay, I lived on the farm. And she conspired to have our trainer work a certain stallion whom I loved. Every morning on my way to work, I would see this horse. And, and I went home and I was like, oh, I'll never be able to see this horse again. So I turned down the job with CBS in New York and, and took a, a look at my life. And I um, asked my parents, I said, well, if I quit the news business, will you hire me? <laughs> <laughs> so they said, sure. So um, I left the news business. and managed um, my parents' Arabian horse farm in Arizona and never looked back. Well, that's, that's, that's really a, a very great story, but you still are involved because at post time you still do a little bit of writing, a little bit of well, yes. stuff, you know? I do. Tell us about a couple of the, uh, of the projects that you've worked with that, that actually have involved horses too. I know of a couple of them. But. Well, the, the one, of course, that I'm the most proud of, oh, sorry, the, <laughs> the most proud of is um, the film that if you've been to the Visitor Center at the Kentucky Horse Park. Right. Um, I, I wrote and, and produced that, and I'm, I'm very proud of that. So you still keep your finger in it a little bit. I do. I, and that's no, great. I, I do. I, I love the opportunity to continue to write and produce. <laughs> You know, you talked about, uh, we've gotten to the, through the Arabian horses a bit, and uh, 
What led you to owning and raising and showing American saddlebreds? Really? Really, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, when my mother was a, a founding member of the, if you remember, the National Show Horse of course, Registry. Of course. Um, she was also uh, on the board for a long time of the Arabian Horse Registry. And um, we had a couple of wonderful Arabian stallions that we thought would cross well with saddlebred mares. And she said, Misty, you're the pedigree student. I want you to go out and learn about saddlebred mares and um, to, to start a, a National Show Horse Breeding Program. So I said, oh, gosh, Mom, I, I, I think I'll probably have to you know, go to California and Kentucky and, and, you know, and, and look at all these horses. And as soon as I, I saw them, and, and there were so many people that were so helpful along the way, um, first and foremost, Don Harris. Um, and I just, I, I fell in love with the American saddlebred. So after looking for mares, I, I went back and I, I told my mother, I said, you know, it would really make sense if our mares had a show record also, and, and so we should buy show mares, and maybe once in a while I, I could show them. <laughs> What a good idea, right? Yeah. <laughs> so um, she's, you know, she saw right through me. But I have a, an interesting sort of, um, you know, one of those ooh ah ooh stories of, of trying to find saddlebred mares. Um, one of my mother's very, very good friends was Mary Del Pritzloff, who recently passed. And she called my mother and said, you know, I have a mare that I think would be a, a very good brood mare, um, and uh, I, and she's also a, a nice harness mare for me, and um, I, you know, would like you to buy her. And my mother deferred on the price and said, "Well, after all, it's just a, a brood mare." And Mary Dell was wonderful. She said, "Well, I, I understand," and um, she subsequently sold the mare to Bettina Bancroft, and. Um, Many, many, many years later, I bought a mare, sight unseen, because Larry Hodge called me and said, I've just seen the most amazing five-gated horse I think I've ever seen. And that mare was Too Sweet to Kiss. Too Sweet to Kiss was a granddaughter of Executive Sweet, who was the mare that Mary Dell Pritzloff wanted us to buy. <laughs> so I'm thinking, Mary Dell, you and my mother are up in heaven conspiring <laughs> to bring this mare into my life. There you go. Well, that, that is really nice. Let's uh, take another question from, from the students. And um, one of the, and it leads to the next, next, thing, next thing in your life. It said, how did you go from showing saddlebreds to competing in combined driving? And uh, the second part of the question was, what, uh, was there a certain person or an event that inspired that decision? Uh, if I can take the second part first. Sure. Yes, the World Equestrian Games in, in Kentucky. Um, because the governor asked me to be on his advisory commission um, for driving because I was probably the only person he knew that I was even remotely involved in driving. I, I did a lot of carriage pleasure driving. And I said, sure, I, I'm, I'm, I know a little bit about combined driving and I'm, I'm happy to. And we had to organize test events um, a couple of years out before the, the games, Jamie will remember well. And I started looking at this and I thought, well, I think some of my coaching horses used to do this and maybe I should just try it to see what it's like. And so I borrowed some equipment and I put my two coaching horses, formerly combined driving horses, together, and I drove in a, a preliminary event. And it was such an adrenaline rush, and I thought, oh, I have to do this. So it's, it's Governor Bashir's fault. Makes sense to me. <laughs> a lot of us came and watched her, too. <laughs> uh, you had um, mentioned your grandfather and your family and those things. And, and being, being your neighbor, I'm a little more familiar with parts of the farm, but one of the, the, the most beautiful areas is, the whole farm is beautiful, but 
I really enjoy her carriage house. And there are a lot of historical carriages and buggies and sleighs and coaches there, but there's a few of them I thought maybe you'd like to just say that you've been able to maintain and keep your family history alive through some of this. Exactly. Well, it's, it's what started me in, in carriage driving in, in the first place. Was um, I, I actually had moved from Scottsdale after, after um, my mother passed to a farm in Ocala, and I got a phone call one day, and the person on the other end of the line said, are you Misty Wrigley? I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. And she said, would you like your carriages? And I'm like, what carriages? It wasn't a cell phone. It was a real phone. And um, she said, well, several years ago, your mother donated two carriages to my father's carriage collection and said, if, um, if you ever decide to close the carriage collection, please find my daughter Misty and get them back to her if she wants them. And I vaguely remembered them, um, and they belonged to my great-grandfather. So I... Uh, called the Carriage Museum of America, and I said, I, how do I know that these carriages are what they're supposed to be? Anyway, it, it started a, a wonderful conversation. Um, and um, so I, I flew out to California, and they told me to, what to look for to determine if they were what they were supposed to be. Apparently, they're very, very fine carriages, which they were. Um, a wicker vis-a-vis -vis, um, that belonged to my great-grandmother, and a bachelor station brougham both made by Brewster and Company, which was the foremost carriage builder um, in America, who, um, when they shut down the carriage plant, all of their coachwork people went to work for Rolls-Royce. And that was a testament to the quality of these carriages. Um, so I went out, and I determined that they were what they were, and I shipped them back. And then I thought, well, I've got these two carriages, so I must drive them. And at the same time, um, I went to the, is it, is it credit, was it the Equifair what, at Louisville? Um, Equitana, was it? Equitana. Yeah. And I went by kind of a, a saddle shop, and I thought, oh, I need a new saddle. So I walked in, and I kind of talked to the proprietor there, and there was a cute little baby in a crib, and, and his mother was there, and... Um, I said, oh, I'm interested in the saddle. And she said, well, you had to talk to my husband, David Friedman. <laughs> so <laughs> that's how I met David Friedman. <laughs> and um, so I asked him about carriages and everything. And, and so he told me a little bit about the harness and saddles and, and things. But the funniest story is I, the, he and Elizabeth Goth were sitting and talking. And I didn't know Elizabeth so well. But I just met David, so I, I felt like, you know, I, I knew him well. So I said, may I join you? And um, they said, sure. And um, David introduced me and, and said, Missy just has, has acquired two carriages. And, she, and Elizabeth was very, and Elizabeth is, uh, knows quite a bit about carriage driving as well. And she says, oh, what kind of carriages did you get? And I said, um, a company called Brewster? And they both sat back and went, wow. <laughs> so that's how actually my friendship with David and Elizabeth started and my introduction to um, carriage driving. So the world really does work in mysterious ways. It certainly does. There's no, no question about that. Um, thinking about your farm here in Kentucky, Hillcroft, you're also living in Florida a good bit of the year too. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, then you'll leave for months at a time and go to Germany. Mm -hmm. And uh, are you finding this difficult? It's the most difficult thing I've done in my life. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely certain of it. And uh, it's uh, hard to keep all those fires burning, I'm sure, but how do you manage to stay focused? Um, honestly, um, I have benefited from working with some very, very good sports psychologists. And um, they have helped me tremendously, especially when I had to um, really ramp up my game and get ready to go to try and make the US team for the World Equestrian Games in 2014, doing a sport that I'd driven two horses, but uh, I'd never tried combined driving with four horses. 
and I started in December, and the World Equestrian Games were in the following September, and I had to, to ramp up my game quickly. So that meant a lot of, of physical training with me and, and my horses, physical training for myself strength-wise, and most importantly, um, training mental-wise. You know, it wouldn't be fair to talk about Hillcroft and talk about Misty without mentioning James, too. Yeah, he's part of Hillcroft. He's part of my he's life. A big part of it. And, and, it's, and you can't talk about James if you don't talk about polo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, 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 it's, and it's importance to, to the Miller family as well as, as the farms and such. And uh, we could expound a little bit on that, but there's been a lot of developments that have been that polo has been very integral a part of Hillcroft Farm, and maybe you can tell us a little bit about what, how you've developed that over the last few years. And it has been the last few years. It, it has been the last few years. I, I feel like I should take off the mic and hand it to, to my partner. So correct me if, if I'm incorrect on anything. But um, actually, polo is how we met. Um, and uh, very briefly, I, I met James's parents at a dinner, and... Um, we discovered the mutual fondness for horses. And um, James's mother said, well, you must meet my son. He plays polo. And I said, ah, oh, I've just always loved to learn to play polo. So uh, it, it took us a while to meet. But um, he taught me polo. He taught me a, a lot of things um, about land stewardship. And um, he's, he's, he's taught me a lot about life. But um, we built a, a polo field and a polo barn, and every summer we bring in a lovely group of, of people, of, of, polo, of polo families, and um, just have great times playing polo on, on Hillcroft Farm. So it's, it's added another equine dimension to, um, to Hillcroft, which is most welcome and most fun. One of the other questions that one of the students wrote was, what would be your three main objectives or goals at running your farm? Got to pick three. Three. Okay. Um, number one, it, that um, James and I will have left a farm that is sustainable um, far into the future, into generations ahead of us. That's, that's the most important thing. Um, to, to protect and, and conserve the land. Um, secondly, during our lifetime, um, to have it as a, a place that people can come and enjoy and, and learn. Um, for example, we were just very honored to be named a, a USEF Elite Training Center um, for, for carriage driving. Um, and that, that means a lot. And thirdly, um, for its all, all of its beauty, its gardens, it is the place that we return to to find peace. Um, <laughs> in our kind of world, worldwide tours, it's the place that we come back and, and it's home and it's where we do. We, we fulfill our soul and, and get back to who we, we are. And it is a beautiful place. Thank you. <laughs> um, another one uh, question that I thought was a very good question uh, that one of the students put together was, is she says, is it difficult to assemble a team of horses for combined driving? And we know it is. <laughs> and does their ability to work well together depend on more on the horses' personalities, or is this something that is taught? And at what age do these horses typically start working in groups? That is such a great question. It's and a I wonderful could, question. I could take the entire rest of the program. <laughs> um, but it, horses, number one, are, are herd animals. So I, I really believe that um, they all find strength and balance in, I think that's one of the greatest things about driving a team of horses, because they figure out very quickly that they need to 
like each other, that they need to learn to work together, that they need to recognize each other's strengths and weaknesses and be able to work with that. And believe it or not, when, when we're working horses, say two leaders, they, you can just tell by their body language that they have no interest whatsoever in, in working together. Now, we can train it into them probably and say, you must do this. But when we start recognize, recognizing that, it's time to find one of the horses and, and say I have one leader that's a really strong horse, then it's time to go back to our scratch pad and say, maybe we need to move this wheeler up. Um, because it, in the midst of competition, when you have to rely on your horses and you throw them the reins and you say go, they, the two guys up in the front really need to trust each other and work together, otherwise you've split a post, you, you, you can tip over. Um, so the answer to the question is, you find a group of horses that actually like each other, that work together, and you can train a certain amount of that into them, but at the end of the day, when you are trusting horses and being fight or flight animals, you know, they're, they're gonna revert to their instinct. Their instinct better be to, to work together and, and figure it out together. There's only so much you can do back there in the carriage with your voice and your reins. You've had a, a good bit of experience with uh, experimenting with a number of different breeds of horses to <laughs> use. And, and, and I think that might be interesting to the group to maybe just go through a little bit of that, so some of that you tested, some that worked out well, some that didn't work as well for you. <laughs> they all work out, sure number they one. They, they, every single horse I've ever laid a finger on has taught me something. So it's, that's worked out perfectly. Um, probably the most difficult horses I've ever worked with are, are hackneys, um, the hackney horses. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're just so hot. Um, and it, when, when everything's working well with a hackney, it's, it's musical. And when everything's not working well with a hackney, it sounds like a symphony orchestra warming up. It's just, it's not good. Um, Frisians taught me a lot. Um, I learned to drive a four in hand with Frisians because they're, they're not temperamental. They're the exact opposite from the hackneys. And you know, it's like I wanted to pull a rein and they would consider for a moment and say, did you really mean to do that? because I'm, I'm not gonna let you make that mistake. So I'm gonna give you a minute to think about it, and then I will act. So Frisians were wonderful that way. Um, uh, the Arabians, I did everything on. I mean, I had one horse that I, I jumped, I rode trail, I rode side saddle, I rode saddle seat, I rode costume. I, they truly are the, the world's most versatile horse. Um, but the the horse that gives me the, the thrill of my life day after day after day um, is the American Saddlebred. That's great. Why? Because <laughs> they, they love who they are. They, they, um, they are indeed the ultimate show horse. They love their job. The good ones love their job. And the ones that don't love their job, just, we just need to find another job for them. And, it, and it's that simple. It is. Because they're, they are so intelligent. Um, they, they want to work with you. Um, they're beautiful. And they're um, that right combination of, of just enough hot-bloodedness that they're, they're a thrill to ride. Um, but I'm, I'm actually, I've got a couple of Western horses in training, and they're joys. They're they're wonderful. So I'm I am now exploring the the versatility of the American saddlebred, and um, I'm hoping to find a couple that you know I'll be able to, to do in the carriage driving as well. Oh, that's neat. Would you use your old saddle with your Western horse? <laughs> <laughs> 
I, I don't think I could get it over a, on, on top of a horse's back. I don't think we could lift it. I don't think you lift it up there. Misty has a has a, has. Oh my goodness! I don't know how old the saddle is, but it's it's got so much silver on it. It would be pretty difficult to lift. It's but but my grandmother. She but did it. Yeah. She she rode her horses. It's a, a, a old Edward Boland saddle. Yeah, it's really pretty cool. It has name plates all over it and with different horses' names and things. But it's part of her tack room. And it, if you ever visit Hillcroft Farm, you uh, just visiting the tack room. There's something just looking at all the harness on the walls and and uh, the equipment that's maintained so perfectly. Um, You're all invited. <laughs> And she does that. The, the, uh, I have to say that James and Misty are so community-minded. They open up their farm for everyone. I don't know anyone's ever been told no uh, when asked for a visit or to use the farm for a fundraiser or whatever, and it's been quite special. Um, thinking about um, saddlebreds and memories, and I know that you must have one particular moment that may exceed all others, and if there is, could you share it with us? Oh, you know what it is. Of course I know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking the question. You have to know the answer. <laughs> um, that, um, that three-gated world championship class with, with Grande Gill, I could close my eyes and remember every step uh, that that horse took, and when he had he had kind of a funny little way the the second way of the trot, and I knew that if I could get him through that you know the reverse and taking off the trot that no one could touch him, and I remember when we reversed and 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 were called to trot, thought you son of a buck, <laughs> you're gonna stay with me here, because <laughs> um, he was a tough horse. I mean, there's no question he was a tough horse. He was a tough horse, but he also had challenges, too, oh. to get to that point. You might a few bring, health challenges? A few health challenges. Um, it's it, quite remarkable, he, actually. He tried to die a couple of times. <laughs> um, he, he had uh, colic surgery. Uh, I had shown him once, and we were, uh, Neil, Neil uh, Visser won his first World Grand Championship. And then I bought him the, the following year and showed him at Kansas City, and everyone thought, oh, it's just <laughs> my, my in-laws and my husband said, oh, my God, you can't ride that horse. <laughs> we can't watch you ride this horse. Um, but he, he colicked um, and had surgery and came through the, the surgery fine. Um, and then he colicked again. Um, within 24 hours, which all of you know is not an ideal situation. And we thought, uh, we thought we'd lost it. And I, I'll, I went into the stall, I'll never forget, I mean, you know, the, the bags hanging with the tubes down, and, and I just said, you, you are a tough horse. You are going to beat this. You are going to live. And, um, and he did. And uh, I was able to show him at the Lexington Junior League show the following July, which was a miracle in, in and of itself. And uh, we won the qualifier. And a, a lot of the vet staff from a, another hospital <laughs> was there <laughs> that had taken care of him. And we got him back to the, the stalls. And he, he wouldn't cool down. Um, and, and he. Spike, his fever was 107, and, and he was breathing hard, and he wouldn't call down. So I ran down that track as fast as I could, and I ran into the stands. I said, you guys, Grande's sick. And <laughs> I have the vet clinic running back down, and he, he had um, very bad pneumonia. Um, and he was in the, the clinic for a, a long time. Um, and he kicked that. And um, we went to Louisville and won the World Grand Championship. That's a, that's a big story. That's, that horse was nothing but hard. Um, and, and it's just, it's so sad that I, I eventually lost him. He had a minor bacterial infection 
that went south quickly and he foundered and that's how I lost Grande. Well, how about now? You've got a few that you enjoy showing currently as well. I, you just want them all in the breeding barn, don't you? <laughs> eventually. eventually. <laughs> I, have, I have an incredible string of horses that we affectionately call Misty's Mares. But it was planned, really. I, I like, it goes back to when I was finding mares for our National Show Horse Breeding Program. Yeah, your mares have great pedigrees. That, you know, it's, uh, once when you're done showing a mare, she's got a, a probably a more important job to do. And um, so I'm, I'm blessed. I've had the most fabulous career and year in the show ring and probably my entire career. Um, and they're just mares of quality and heart. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm having so much fun. But I think I'm going to have a, an equal amount of fun watching their babies grow up. Hey, that's great. That's great. Um, Switching gears just a little bit, um, one of the other questions we had was, uh, what is your favorite phase of the combined driving? What, what do you enjoy the most? That's a trick question. Um, because uh, probably now, my favorite phase is the, uh, the third day, the cones, um, because it, it requires um, finesse and skill and it's the the third day like stadium jumping and uh, during eventing um, that your your horses are, are really very tired you're very tired as a driver <clears throat> and you have approximately three minutes to negotiate a, a very very difficult course as as well as you can um, so because I really love that challenge, I, I think that's my, my favorite phase. So, so would that also be your favorite part of the WEG games where you participate in those? Well, it was because um, that's probably where I learned to, to love cones because um, we, we knew where we were sitting as a team and we weren't given a snowball's chance in hell, by the way, to, to finish very well. and. Um, we were actually sitting very well, and the other woman driver, we were the first two women to be named to a, a team for driving, and we were comparable in dressage, and I knew that her marathon was better than, than mine, but she said, Misty, I, I haven't mastered cones yet. You need to pull out the, the score for the cones. So I, I had all that weight on my shoulders, and uh, I'll never forget it um, that morning in Normandy. And I thought, hey, everything that I've sacrificed all summer, all year, actually, um, being away from my farm, my friends, my family, my saddlebreds, yeah, mm -hmm. it's, um, it's, it's all come down to the next three minutes. I mean, it's, that's it, period. Um, you know, be a hero or go home. <laughs> so, um, no, I just sort of... You know, the, the bell went off, and I just kind of sat back in the carriage seat, and I went, this is it. This is just give it, give it everything you have. And, and I delivered the score that we needed to, okay, we got four. But we were so close to a bronze medal. I mean, and, and so we were within 3.2 points of a bronze medal. And everyone, all the odds makers said, you know, if, if the USA finishes in ninth, they should be happy. So it was, it was a really great moment. Great. That's wonderful. Um, changing subjects again, what would you say has been your biggest challenge to overcome as being a part of the equine industry? What has been your biggest challenge that you faced? I think it's ongoing. Um, and that is to keep um, the horse industry relevant mm -hmm. in um, a period of time where the American public has so many different choices of what to do with their, their leisure time. And um, I think it, it is imperative that all of us in, 
involved in the horse industry do what we can, and, and I think we are making great strides through social media and, and other um, media um, to, to keep us relevant, but we can't ever forget that um, we always need to, to keep working to keep the horse industry relevant, in, especially with our youth, um, because there's, there's no better way to, to raise children than with horses. There's no more special bond than with a, a mother and father that go with their child to a horse show, to a, a weekend show, um, and, and to start it at that age. And it's, you know, it, I look back at my life, I wouldn't have changed one moment growing up um, for the, the friends that I still have today that I made through the, the horse show, the, the weekend horse shows that we would go to. Um, I'm thankful every day you know, for the horses, what they taught me, the responsibilities. Um, and so that's, that's my challenge. That's what I'm, I'm working on, How to keep the horse industry relevant. How would you grow the horse industry, specifically with youth involvement? And even now, it's, uh, some of us have had conversations regarding maybe it's not totally youth, maybe it's adult participation as well, because there is a considerable amount of competition for that leisure time activity. And it's, it's different with the agricultural community shrinking. Mm -hmm. There's less land. What you're doing with Hillcroft is very commendable, but that's not happening across the board. So how, how do we... How do we grow this industry? I think that we need to use the tools um, that we have available to us. I mentioned social media. Mm -hmm. I think that's imperative that, that we keep the, the horse industry um, on that digital platform. I would love to see um, more, uh, I would love to see a horse network launched that, you know, that is accessible, that teaches people um, about horses, about careers in, in horses. I think the, the program here is amazing. Uh, and we just need to keep the, the industry in the, the forefront of the focus of, of education. And um, I'm sure people a lot smarter than, than I uh, would know the, the next place to to present the horse industry, but by golly, I'll be, be behind them, backing them the whole time. It, it is a challenge, there's no question about that. And, and University of Kentucky here is, is really doing well, turning out a lot of young people, mm -hmm. a lot of graduates. In fact, the program has grown in such leaps and bounds that sometimes it's hard to keep up with the curricula. Um, Which is great. It is, there's no question about it. Uh, Getting back to James. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we talked about polo and everything, but James is a, is a pretty darn good horseman in other areas, too, and, and, and his involvement not only with, uh, with, with polo, but he's been showing American saddlebreds. He's been riding and driving, and he's also doing a bit of coaching, too. I, I, I am so fortunate. I thought, thought you would like to embellish that just a little bit. <laughs> um. It's so important that, as, as all of us in the horse business know, it's, it's all consuming. It's 24-7. It's um, if you're not with your horses, you're thinking about your horses. You're worrying about your horses. Um, and I said at the beginning that, you know, I, I didn't care about personal relationships. I just, you know, <laughs> I, I mean. So it takes a, a very, very special partner um, when you are as in love with the horse industry as, as I am. And... I'm so fortunate to, to find a man that, number one, he is such a natural horseman. He, he, I'm kind of jealous <laughs> because he, he can jump on any horse and, and he's, he's a natural rider. And um, he's embraced everything that I've done. He's been supportive and not only supportive, but I can do this too. So um, we, at the Saddlebred shows, you know, he would get bored. He's a little ADD. And I, I had to keep him amused. So I said, let's, let's get you a horse. So we found him a, a fabulous road horse. And you know, now we're like 
James, take it easy. James, go go a little slower. You know, but there's there's no backup in him. So you know, he would go flying. He he gets an expression we call his we, we call his Mad Max expression. <laughs> and then you know you know Charlie Jones, look out. Yeah. Um, and then he said, well, you know, okay, Misty. You know, I'm not like the only husband or boyfriend that drives a road horse. Can I do something else? So Larry Hodge, Kalorama, thank you, Larry, said, well, I think, I think James could ride a gated horse. I, I think that would, and so I said, you know, when, when you find the right gated horse, let's go for it. And it, it didn't take very long that um, Larry, Larry's the master of matching horses to riders. Uh, he is. And um, we found Fox Great Stuntless, said, I think this is the horse. So that horse has been so wonderful. So there, and James, James was really good about going out and practice riding, and he took, he took lessons and everything, and he went from polo boy, the Bill Will still calls him <laughs> polo boy, to, you know, to being fairly competitive in, in the five-gated division, very competitive. So there was one day that James couldn't come to Colorado with me for, to ride for whatever reason, and I'd actually never ridden Dauntless. So I said, please, honey, just one time, can I ride Dauntless? So I said, yeah, sure, go ahead. I can't ride the horse. <laughs> He's a tough horse. So that's, you know, that's when I said, you know, it's a, that horse loves James, and James loves that horse, and they're, they're together forever. That's great. That's great. Having, uh, uh, again, I, I mentioned that uh, Misty and I have had a history of, of involvement with American Saddlebred Horses, of course, over time. Um, it's been a few years ago, but we, we've been involved in a lot of different groups and organizations and associations and, and volunteer leadership and that type of thing. And Misty continues to give of herself uh, uh, with selflessly. And there's a big difference in selfish and selfless service. And when you, when you give of yourself to a cause without expecting anything in return, that is, that is your true gift. And I'd like for you to just ex expound a little bit on why you give back to the industry, what you do with your involvement and your work. Because the industry's been my life. Um, the industry has shaped who I am. Um, ever since I, I made that very fateful decision um, not to go with CBS News, I decided to, to devote my life to the industry and not just take from the industry, but to, to be a part. If, if that was gonna be my life, then I needed to do something to make it better. Maybe I needed to do a, a lot of things to make it better. And so, oh my gosh, Fred and I have been in the trenches together. <laughs> <laughs> there were some days that we just looked at each other and went, why? <laughs> why are we doing this? And, and the reason why you fight so hard for what you believe in it, and we've, we've fought over some very significant issues very significant issues that affect the, the state, um, affect our breed, and you, you do it because it's your life. And you want to, to make the industry a, a little bit better because of, of what you've done. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's the, the horses and the horse people and the horse industry have um, been so good to me, and and I just want to give a little something back. Well put, well put. You know, we're we're covering a a, a lot of things that uh, uh, sometimes things are tough, a little tough discussions and those type mm -hmm. of things. One of the things that I thought about doing this evening was uh, maybe just presenting a little bit of, a, of an educational forum from the standpoint of, of, you know, we're talking a lot about uh, breeds and disciplines and uh, uh, our mutual love, of course, of the American Saddlebred Horse goes with, 
goes uh, very, very deeply within us all. And, and sometimes this horse is a bit misunderstood. Mm -hmm. And um, and when you look at the, if you look at the cover of your program and you see the wonderful Grande Gill and you see him with his, what you think is his leg is in a very unnatural position. But the truth of the matter is that is natural for him. Mm -hmm. And the difference between American Saddlebreds and, and other types of horses that we see in shows are that they trot. And a horse that trot must be sound. And that is, that, is, that is what separates them from other breeds of horses. And this inner beauty and the charisma, if you would, and the energy that comes off of it. And I thought you might expound a little bit on, on those attributes and, and, and how this horse works and how he fits in and how his versatility applies. We, you talked about having a Western horse and, and we have some that are doing pretty well in classical dressage. Mm -hmm. Some are being jumped. You know, they make great jumpers. Mm -hmm. They do a nice job that way. But I thought maybe you could, could expand a little bit with that, with some of the, your experience and some of your friends' experiences that uh, they bring with it. But we, there is sometimes a misconception of what this horse really is about. Yeah, of course. Um, it, you know, horses are a lot like people, that we're built differently. We have different athletic abilities. Um, some of us are like a, a Michael Phelps in the, the swimming pool, and um, some of us sink to the bottom. <laughs> some of us are not. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, what, what Grande Gill had was an amazing natural ability to trot a four-square trot. I mean, his hocks were, I've never known a horse to, to be able to use his hocks and get under himself like he did, which only allowed him to, to elevate in his front end. And of course, he had this, this neck that went on forever that I kind of had to look around to see where I was going down the, the rail. Um, and, and of course, a trainer's job is like a, a personal trainer in, in a gym. You recognize an athlete that has certain attributes and, and you work towards those attributes. You can't make a horse do what Grande Gill did. He had the most amazing natural talent. It could be developed, um, which it, it was, um, expertly at, at Kalorama. And um, other horses, if they don't have those natural attributes, then um, I think I mentioned earlier, we need to find they other need a jobs job. for they them. Need a job. And, and train them with the same respect that we train a, a world champion, with, with respect to those horses and what they can do. Um, it's our responsibility as, as trainers and owners to allow that horse to be the best it can be. And, and I don't care if that's a, a... One of the horses I'm most proud of is a beloved therapeutic horse um, at the Marion um, Therapeutic Riding, uh, a therapeutic riding center in, in Ocala. Most beloved horse, and I'm, and I'm proud of that. That's great. You know, you had another world grand champion too. His name was Castle Dream, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> he might have been a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But I, everyone was also a little panicked. You're, you're drawing on a theme here. People are a little panicked when I show this horse. I've always liked a game horse. I, I always have. I've never backed down from a challenge. Um, but Castle Dream, he's a big wuss. He likes his tongue scratched, for goodness sakes. He just he got a little exuberant when he won a class. And he would leap and lurch a little bit. But during the class, he... Uh, to this day, it's you, you'll remember, and anyone who was there will remember. Uh, um, the only time one of my horses I, I felt was not appreciated in, in its win, when he showed against the Da Vinci Code, and he got polite applause when when called out as world grand champion, which is, you know, it's the first time that I, as an owner, had had won, and um, uh, and Da Vinci Code brought the house down and for, for getting reserve. And, you know, it, that, that hurts a little bit. Um, but 
to this day, I still think that you know the, the fine harness horse in in my mind is a is a very classic horse, and um, I believe and until I met maybe a horse I'm driving now, um, no one could wear a, a overcheck like that horse could again a natural natural talent just he, was developed. He was, and didn't he go back to Hillcroft for a little remedial work too at one time? I well, think. yeah, he did. <laughs> he, yeah, yeah. We we put him to one of the combined driving um, four wheel training carriages and made him trot around the hills and, and <laughs> just just so he could be reminded at how good he had it at Colorado, and he just had the little bike to to pull around, and it it, it worked. It sure did. It worked. It sure did. He was hooked in tandem too, wasn't he? As a pair. As a pair. Yes. Yeah, yeah, as a pair. Yeah, he was hooked pair. as a pair. Mm -hmm. Did he like that very much? He hated it. <laughs> he hated not being the star. I can see that. <laughs> said, Get rid of that guy. Those, he adds those. nothing. Think about combined driving. What do you look? What do you really look for in a horse when you're picking a when you're picking a horse? Of course, sometimes you're not just picking one horse. You're picking multiple horses. It, it, yeah, um, the underlying thing that well, it different different drivers look for different things, and hence you have a, a lot of specialists. You have um, combined drivers who specialize in the marathon. You have. Um, combined drivers that specialize in, in the dressage phase. Um, so I will speak to what I personally look for. Um, and because probably the, the way I was taught um, when I was learning combined driving, that the, the basic of combined driving is dressage. Um, uh, the, the suppleness of the horses, its ability to bend correctly, um, to, to engage its... its rear end, um, and that that is the basis of everything that we do in combined driving. Um, the marathon phase, I mean, they need to, to shrink up and and just be able to bend like snakes around some of these obstacles. And, and the cones phase that um, I spoke about, again, high degree of, of flexibility, willingness, um, Good contact on the hands. You know, they, you have to have the perfect contact. If it's too much contact, you can't drive them. If you have no contact, you're taking loops in the air, and you're going to knock down every cone. So, you have to have a horse that is built for and has um, the the mind to be a good dressage horse. So that's that's what I look for. That's great. I'm thinking of. Um um, when you when you were mentioning dressage as 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 the impetus behind that, mm -hmm. and and it brought to mind too that with American saddlebreds, and we're thinking about horses. We, you know, horses don't pull they don't pull themselves. They it, everything starts with the back end and, and collection, and collection, and um, and I think some of the. Uh, uh, training techniques involved even in classical dressage are actually put in place with a lot of our horse training in mm -hmm. terms of being supple and bending and collection and all those type of things. Um, one of the uh, students wrote a question and wanted to know if you, where you showed your carriage horses besides Lexington Junior League. You know, it, there are more than one show. Well, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so you do you do go to other places, and uh, I, they I, would like to like to maybe know where where else uh, they can see these classes. Oh, do I, do I get to, to promote my horse show? You do. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, October 9th through thirteenth. <laughs> I think we finally got a, out of Keeneland. Um, no, we, we do have. Um, I'm the organizer of a, a wonderful combined driving show at the at the horse park. And um, we're trying to grow it into, it, it, uh, it, it's an FEI two-star show. So I'm very proud that, that we got that. So that's also in Lexington um, in October. But there are carriage driving um, classes, and, and there's the, the two types of carriage driving, the, the pleasure carriage driving, which um, is much less demanding and um, is... is um, it's a lot of fun because it's it's a, it's very social, 
And my husband wants me to start a, a pleasure driving show at, at Hillcroft, which would be great fun. Um, so uh, we do coach. There's, um, there are two coaching clubs in America. He's hating this. <laughs> one, one is the New York Coaching Club, which is the men's club, and the other is the World Coaching Club, which is the women's club. And um, so there's a, there's a little rivalry going there. But there, um, there are, are horse shows around the, the country. Um, the biggest coaching show today is at the um, Canadian Royal. And, um, but there's uh, pleasure shows. There's a great pleasure show here in Lexington over the um, first weekend of July, right before Lexington Junior League. And um, so if anyone is interested, I can put them on the correct website to go find horse shows. But I would love it if everyone would come to my show in um, October. <laughs> it would be great. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, you know, you mentioned FEI, and uh, Misty is uh, on the uh, board of the United States Equestrian Federation, and she is an athlete, as well as I recall. Is that right? That is how you get, get your position. But she's also put in a very unique spot because she's involved in the national side of the sport and, and also with, with the FEI disciplines, which is high performance and those type of things. And, and, and those of us who have kind of been around, there can sometimes be tensions mm -hmm. between, between the groups. And, and uh, it goes back to when the Federation became the national governing body for equestrian sport in the country. And this is when the USET and the old American Horses Association merged together and, and not a friendly situation, but, but it's, it's been to the benefit of equestrian sport. There's no question about that. How do you balance that? When you're on the board and, and, and you, you've got to you know, listen no, to two it, sides. It, it, I think um, my grandfather um, told me something very wise once. Um, he was his owner of the Chicago Cubs, and and he was often asked some very difficult questions, and you know whether he was going to come down on the side of management and the owners or the the players, and and he said, you know, Misty, I get accused of of sitting on the fence <laughs> and not making a decision one way or the other, and he said, really, sitting on the fence is the most difficult place to be because you see both sides clearly. And I've never forgotten that. And um, so if anyone ever accuses me of fence sitting, I'm really taking my time looking at both sides. And I think that I'm really in a great place because I, I really do understand both sides. And if I am able to speak well for both sides um, and contribute to a better discussion, and better decision making, I think that I'm really a, in a unique and, and wonderful place. And um, so I, I really enjoy having the experience of being on, on both sides of that fence because I think I, I understand both sides of that fence. I might also add if there's a cause that she's behind, there's not anyone that will be a bigger <laughs> fighter for that cause. Um, I want to round this out uh, in your own words and with whatever, whatever, however you would like to uh, do this, but I'd like for you to think about future ambitions, goals, where you see your farm, where you see it in now, where you see it in five years, ten years. What, where, where, where will the pinnacle be? What, 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 is, where, what is driving you now? Where do you want to be? Uh, my immediate goal uh, with the combined driving horses is to make the U.S. team and to help win a medal um, in uh, 2018. And uh, I'm working very hard on that starting tomorrow. <laughs> I've had a few days <laughs> off. Um, because that, do, to be able to, number one, to represent your nation at an international competition is an amazing honor. Um, I heard a statistic that less than 1% of the population has ever gotten to represent the United States. And to be able to do that is, 
is simply amazing. Um, for the farm um, to continue to open it up, um, James and I established a program at the USET um, called the Developing Driver um, Program. And we are actively identifying drivers and or horses around the country to bring into the, the driving sport and hopefully get up to the advanced FEI level of driving. And that's, that's been a tremendous success. And, and Hillcroft Farm is um, the site of a couple of clinics each year, and we have clinics around the country. So to be able to develop the farm um, and, and grow it, not only to conserve it, but um, as a, a place to invite people to come, to train, to enjoy horses, um, to enjoy the land, to appreciate how important it is to maintain our, our land, our bluegrass land, our, our equine-oriented land. Um, and um, I, I just, when I'm 90, I, I want to be able to, to go out and throw my leg over a, a horse and ride around Hillcroft with my husband and say, look, what a, what a beautiful place we have here. And hopefully future generations will enjoy it. That's great. We're going to close here in just a, in a minute or two, but I want Misty to, uh, I, think, I think the best way to close this uh, interview or this conversation, if you would, is if you have just some wisdom or advice to give to the young people that are developing careers and want to have careers in the horse industry, what would you tell them? Oh, gosh. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a heavy burden. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I'm that wise. <laughs> um, I, I suppose, um, I like the path that, that I chose very, very much. Um, I had a dream to be the best horsewoman, the most well-rounded horsewoman I could be, and, and that was all phases of it. That included going to the short course at CSU to, to learn about artificial insemination. Um, that included um, managing horse auctions. Um, I, I think I, I tried not only a, a lot of different breeds of horses and certainly a number of different disciplines, but also um, a, a lot of areas within the horse industry. Um, and, and to never stop learning. And, um, and in that way, I, I think that I understand the industry, that I hope, I, I feel like, through my service on the, the Saddlebred Association Board, the, the USEF, um, the USET, um, that I can contribute back. Um, so, so to be able to, to take and learn from everything that is available to us in, in this wonderful world we call the horse industry. And then at some point, give back. So it, it comes full circle. Um, because I'm, I'm sitting here where, where I am now, and I, I can honestly say, Fred, I don't regret a, a single moment, a single decision that I've made. So if, if everyone out there can get to ripe old age where I am, <laughs> um, through being involved in the horse industry, then it's a, it's a really good place to be. That's great. Well, thank you, Misty. This has been a great conversation. Thank you, Greg.